Welcome to Basic Black. Some of you are joining us on our broadcast and others of you are joining us on our digital platforms. I'm Callie Crossley, host of Under the Radar 89.7. Tonight, a new Supreme Court justice, the nomination of Katanji Brown Jackson. We, like you, are dealing with the effects of the coronavirus pandemic and are taking precautions. We are working with limited staff and our guests are joining us remotely. It wasn't about her judicial experience, as it might have been for any other Supreme Court nominee. No, Judge Katanji Brown Jackson, the first African-American woman to be nominated to the nation's highest court, faced a barrage of hostile questions, cherry-picking her sentencing record on child pornography and demanding she respond to ongoing culture war issues about transgender rights and teaching anti-racism in schools. Millions of black Americans, especially black women, empathized watching her command a professional posture during nearly 24 hours of questioning over two days. On Monday, the Senate Judiciary Committee will vote on whether to support her confirmation for a full Senate vote. Will Katanji Brown Jackson make history by ascending to a seat on the Supreme Court? Joining us remotely, Renee Landers, professor of law and faculty director of the Health and Biomedical Law Concentration and the Masters of law Science in Law Life Sciences Program at Suffolk University Law School in Boston. Tracy Macklin, professor of law at Boston University School of Law. Renee Graham, associate editor and opinion columnist for the Boston Globe's op-ed page. And Dr. Cecil R. Webster, Jr., a psychiatrist and lecturer at Harvard Medical School. Welcome to you all. I want to start this way by letting Judge Katanji Brown Jackson set uh, the table as she did at the hearings about who she was. So many black girls and women were looking at her um, because she was going to be potentially the first black woman to become a Supreme Court justice. And here she is acknowledging herself that this is a historical moment. I do consider myself, having been born in 1970, to be the first generation to benefit from the civil rights movement, from the legacy of all of the work of so many people that went into changing the laws in this country so that people like me could have an opportunity to be sitting here before you today. So, Renee Graham, you say this is monumental. It is. I mean, this is something. You're talking about 233 years of the Supreme Court. There have been 115 justices. Only eight, well, she would be the eighth, have not been white men. And so we're talking about not just the first black nominee, black, black female nominee, we're talking about the first black woman to get to the Supreme Court. And there's very little question that she's going to get there because Republicans do not have the votes to keep her out. Uh, Joe Manchin of West Virginia, the Democratic Senator has already said that he's on board, as has Republican Senator Susan Collins of Maine. So Republicans can't stop this. But what they did attempt to do, of course, was to make the process as horrible and arduous as her, as for her as possible. And yet um, her credentials are for many, um, unquestionable. Uh, the American Bar Association, Tracy Macklin, uh, rated her well qualified. People should know that is the <laughs> highest rating that one can give uh, a judge. And you saw early on that she was as smart as she was. She was a former student of yours. That's correct, and the ABA is dead on. Uh, there's no question, and that's why, frankly, you didn't see any uh, questions related to her credentials. She's extremely well qualified. And so what we're going to talk about really is very sad because this should have been an easy hearing. Uh, this is all about the politics of, of the moment and not and have nothing to do with her qualifications. So Renee Landers, you say um, it's a big stage is what it was <coughs> and that the people who were participating those who are opposing her, and even just to a large extent, Judge Katanji Brown Jackson have roles to play if they're gonna make it through the process, and for her, if she was going to be able to make it through the process. Uh, talk about what you mean there. Uh, so sure, um, I think I wanted to agree with um, Tracy that um, one of the, uh, it was an opportunity for uh, the Republican opposition to grandstand and to reemphasize their talking points 
that they're going to be hammering home during the midterm elections this fall on uh, you know issues related to the culture wars, uh, you know the, the the perception and the stereotype that it's people of color who could commit crimes, uh, the uh, the perception and the QAnon theories about um, uh, you know Democrats being uh, you know favorable and coddling uh, pedophiles and running pedophilia rings, which you know obviously is is not true, and then um, uh, and then finally the culture war issues over. Uh, what uh, students can learn in school, whether in fact students uh, can be taught about the complicated history around race, gender, uh, and uh, rights of, of people uh, uh, who have uh, different uh, sexual orientations and uh, sexual identities that are, are that are not, um, you know, traditionally heterosexual. And so um, I think that it was just a, 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 a an opportunity to kind of put those issues into the minds of the public and reinforce those questions. And I think for her, from her point of view, uh, you know, she's totally succeeded uh, in staying calm and professional because um, uh, people of color do not have the option, or at least women of color do not have the option of uh, reacting emotionally uh, or angrily when challenged in that way, um, in the way that you know Clarence Thomas did at his um, confirmation hearings, and also um, Justice Kavanaugh, so I think that uh, she totally succeeded in presenting herself as the very qualified and professional uh, candidate she is for a seat on the Supreme Court. So um, I'm sure most people didn't have a chance to watch 24 hours of the testimony and see. Uh, some of the most, uh, I would describe them as brutal uh, questioning. So let's uh, take a look at one that was particularly brutal, brutal from Texas Senator uh, Ted Cruz. He pressed Judge Katanji Brown-Jackson about critical race theory, asking her about Ibram X. Kendi's book, Anti-Racist Baby. Take a look. Another portion of the book, they recommend to babies confess when being racist. Now, this is a book that is taught at Georgetown Day School to students in pre-K through second grade, so four through seven years old. Um, do, do you agree with this book that is being taught with kids that, that babies are racist? Senator. I do not believe that any child should be made to feel as though they are racist or though they are not valued or though they are less than, that they are victims, that they are oppressors. I don't believe in any of that. But what I will say is that when you asked me whether or not this was taught in schools, critical race theory, my understanding is that critical race theory as an academic theory is taught in law schools. And to the extent that you were asking the question, I understood you to be addressing public schools. Georgetown Day School, just like the religious school that Justice Barrett was on the board of, is a private school. OK. Well, two things. Um, first of all, uh, so-called critical race theory is not being taught. Anywhere, anywhere, I have to say this every time we have this conversation, in K through 12 school, anywhere, period. <laughs> That's the first thing. The second thing is uh, the very book, Ibram X. Kendi's book, Anti-Racist Baby, that uh, Texas Senator Ted Cruz attacked uh, the judge about, is being taught as part of the curriculum at a school his children attend. Just want to put that in. Now, to you, Dr. Cecil uh, Webster. Um, what I appreciate is your taking in the history of the moment, the monumental nature of the moment, uh, by taking a look at her sitting in that seat. Tell, share with uh, what you were thinking when you saw her sitting there, as she did in this instance, responding back to uh, Texas Senator Ted Cruz. Well, yeah, absolutely. Um, I think for many of us that had an opportunity to see these hearings, um, when she first got into that chair, uh, it reminded us that many of us have never seen a black woman in that chair. In fact, that is the case. Like, no black woman has been up for this sort of nomination before. Um, and this, you know, uh, this might be a personal bias, of course, but I, I certainly don't see many uh, uh, 
professional, black professionals with locks, much less for a Supreme Court nomination. Um, I've just gotten back from a parental leave. I was holding my my son, and it allowed me to even imagine like, oh, this like this world is widening uh, for the opportunities that are available uh, to kids like my son Isaac, or with the many people that I get to see um, in my clinical practice. Um, I think many people, as, as you allude to, very much Today, recognize many of those pauses and those shifts and those eyebrow raises and the difficulties uh, with which uh, Judge Jackson had to face in that seat. But it also allowed us a lot of um, um, joy to see that this is a more full reflection of who we are as Americans. So Tracy Macklin, um, aside from our moment of pride, which there's <laughs> lots of moment of pride about this as we've seen, um, you make the point that uh, should she be confirmed, and um, Renee Graham has said she's most likely will be confirmed, that's not going to change the balance on the court, um, that that is something that, that uh, certainly communities of color need to be thinking about as well while we hold that joy that Cecil <coughs> was talking about because the decisions that will come out of the court may look the same. Oh, well, they will look the same. It's, she's not going to change the balance of the court one iota, um, and that's just the reality uh, because of how the court is presently constituted. And if I could just quickly go back to Senator Cruz's question, I mean, it was frankly one of the sillier questions because the Supreme Court is never going to deal with the subject matter of his discussion. It's just not going to come up. Uh, and so for him to push her and challenge her on that is frankly, he knows better. Ted Cruz clerked for Chief Justice, former Chief Justice uh, Bill Rehnquist. Ted Cruz is a smart enough guy to know that that subject is never going to see the light of day in the Supreme Court. So it's just another example of how they weren't really serious about assessing her qualifications or her judicial temperament. This was all, as Renee, as both Renees have said, it's just political grandstanding. Um, I am fond of noting that right after he did that display, um, a photographer caught him scrolling th on Twitter to see if his uh, name was being mentioned. So grandstanding indeed, he wanted, it was documented at the time. So back to you, Renee. So we saw on display, a lot of people would say, hey, you're supposed to ask them hard questions. You're supposed to act, ask them tough questions. This is the highest court in the land. Uh, make it plain for people to understand that the way in which the questions were structured and the manner in which they approached her was really racially quoted, coded. Um, which Renee would you would? Oh, I'm sorry, uh, like Graham. To... I'm sorry, <laughs> Renee Graham. <laughs> um, you know, watching it, I just kept thinking about what uh, Senate Minority Leader Mitch McConnell had said that this was going to be a serious and dignified process, which of course it was not, and it couldn't be. You know, they weren't trying to illuminate anything about Judge Jackson. What they were doing was creating a performance for the base back home, and for some of them, a kind of sizzle reel for their probable presidential campaigns. And as I was watching it, what it continually reminded me of was years ago, I interviewed for a job in a newspaper. And the minute I walked in the door, they put me in a windowless room and for three hours, I was subjected to a battery of tests, written tests, psychological tests, personality tests. When I finally got the job, I asked what role those tests played in their hiring process. And the editor said, none. The whole point of those tests is to break you down. Wow. to reveal who you actually are. And that's what I feel like they were really trying to do to Judge Jackson. They wanted to provoke this sort of angry <laughs> black woman moment to show that she has neither the temperament nor the demeanor to be on the Supreme Court. They know they can't keep her off the court, but they still want to make this overall <coughs> statement, I thought, about <laughs> black women and you know, to sort of show what was lurking beneath all of her qualifications. But ultimately, it said far more about Republicans than it said about Judge Jackson. So, Renee Landers, um, what's your takeaway from the, uh, other than what has been said about the brutality of the questions and their point of what they were doing grandstanding, because it wasn't going to achieve anything. They obviously were speaking beyond the, the meeting to other kinds of constituencies, because some of them are planning to run for higher office. Uh, even some for president. What's your takeaway then about um, how we should look at these hearings and how she was treated and um, 
what may be to come, I guess, uh, sh should she be ascending to the court? So I think that the hearings just um, reflect how the process has um, deteriorated over the time. And uh, I think Republicans would say, you know, it all the Democrats started it all with um, uh, the confirmation hearing for uh, Robert Bork when he was nominated for the Supreme Court. And I think it's a totally different situation um, because those hearings really were about his um, stated views about uh, various aspects of the law that would be very important in his role as a Supreme Court justice, his attitude toward uh, the civil rights laws, um, his attitude toward people of color, his attitude toward rights of people uh, for reproductive freedom. And I think those were um, actually fair, uh, that was fair territory for questioning. And he revealed himself to uh, possess uh, neither the temperament nor the broad-mindedness that uh, would be uh, would be a qualification or essential for a Supreme Court justice. So I think that um, you know since then uh, you know we had some you know uh, uh, moments when uh, the confirmation hearings for uh, Justice Ginsburg, Justice Breyer, even who um, uh, Judge Jackson uh, Brown Jackson would be succeeding. Those were um, actually more or less focused on questions about judicial philosophy and the, the role of the judiciary in um, applying the law uh, and deciding, you know, complex questions where, you know, the law doesn't clearly have an answer. And um, and so but then the, the, it has become much more partisan. And so um, I think the ultimate effect of this is that it um, it uh, plants a seed in the mind of public the public uh, that uh, discredits the court mm -hmm. uh, that uh, uh, probably will um, reduce uh, in in some circles uh, the moral suasion and uh, the value or the um, uh, the respect for the decisions that the court ha uh, makes. And, uh, and I think that that is really, uh, really unfortunate because one of the hallmarks, you know, in the last several decades, uh, <clears throat> you know, through the 60s and perhaps 70s, early 80s, was that there was great respect for the decisions of the court, even if people didn't particularly agree with them. So, can I, Callie, can I, can I say something real quickly? Uh-huh. Uh, I agree with most of what Renee Landers just said, but some of this is also on the nominee's themselves, because Renee is right that there needs to be more substantive uh, discussion. Uh, and some of that comes from the questions of the senators. And we didn't see any questions of substance from the senators. Mm -hmm. But in the past, we have had seen that. Uh, but we have nominees, Justice Ginsburg, Justice uh, some of the other justices, who refuse to talk about the subject because say, well, that might come up. And I think we need to have more substantive responses. I understand that they can't talk about an issue that may be currently uh, on the court's docket or soon to be on the court's docket, but the nominees should talk about, for example, they, Clarence Thomas was asked, well, what do you think about Roe v. Wade? And this was 1991. Now, his response was, well, I've never read it. Well, that just doesn't buy, you know, that doesn't pass the, a straight face test. So we should be able to ask these nominees, well, okay, we understand you might not want to talk about an issue that's coming up, but let's talk about a case that's already been decided. Roe v. Wade, Brown versus Texas, Tex, I'm, Brown versus Board of Ed, uh, Lawrence versus Texas. Those are all cases that are on the books, are not, the Supreme Court's not going to see those cases anymore. Let's talk about the <laughs> substance of those cases. And that's what's missing right now in, in, in the hearings. And frankly, I don't think it's going to uh, change in the future. I would agree with you. <laughs> and I would suggest that that's logical. And now those any of those candidates on either side knows if they say anything, um, A, it could come back in a precedent situation, and B, that will immediately knock them out. And so they're boxed in. Um, and that's the fault, I think, uh, as, as Renee Landers was saying, of our system allowing this to change. But, but here we are. I, I would be remiss. Can I just say, can I just say one thing about Tracy's comment? Um, Justice Ginsburg actually did answer the question about Roe v. Wade. I think you're right that she kind of uh, 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 skated around some of the other issues that she was asked, but she did answer the, a question about Roe v. Wade and said she was unequivocally 
going to, uh, you know, continue to, um, uh, you know, make sure that the court uh, protected the rights, reproductive freedom of women. Okay. <clears throat> I would be remiss, uh, Dr. Cecil, if I did not uh, ask you to address uh, what I would describe as a collective, collective psychic um, damage done by all of us who, uh, communities of color, watching this and watching uh, <coughs> brutalization, the hostileness, and have watching her uh, stand up however she had to stand up and not respond. Um, so first, let me hear you talk about that. And then I want to um, play something from uh, Senator Cory Booker, who tried to address that. But, but first, your response to the psychic collective damage. Well, yeah, but I think you bring up a really important point. Like, I'm sitting with my family watching this. It's all really painful for us to watch. Uh, we have to witness uh, this, this Black woman who represents much of America um, be mischaracterized at best and demonized at worst. She's made to uh, be inhuman. Um, uh, their actions really suggest uh, that there's a lot of fear, like fear of what she might represent in the minds of people, uh, minds of many Americans, perhaps. And when we have fear, like it, it shuts down parts of our brains that really allow us to solve complex problems. America has plenty of those. Um, it really shuts down our ability to weigh risk, uh, and we do so pretty poorly. And it really doesn't allow us to really see others as human. And when all those things break down, we, we have a tendency to treat each other pretty poorly. And so, you know, when I'm, when I'm looking at these hearings, um, I get to see her daughter right behind her um, as these senators are asking question after question about child pornography and suggesting that um, she could somehow light on crime, uh, that she's basically a terrible person, doing so in front of her adolescent daughter. Uh, that's not something that we normally do to other human beings, uh, shame them in the ways of, 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 of the spectacles that we got to see. And I think everybody's made a really good point of really reminding us that um, this was more about um, prioritizing strategic advantage, political strategic advantage, more than really getting a sense of her uh, judicial capacities, her funds of knowledge, her temperament, and other things like that. So we're really suggesting to most of America that, you know, you can be exquisitely credentialed, uh, but you have to be better than good in order to make up for one's blackness or make up for some uh, um, other aspect of their identity. And that's really what I hear from the kids that I get to see. That's really what I get to hear from many of the young professionals that I see in my practice. So near the end of the second day of rabid questions by some Republicans, New Jersey Senator Cory Booker used his time to underscore Judge Brown Jackson's credentials and make note of the historic significance of her nomination. And you did not get there because of some left-wing agenda? You didn't get here because of some dark money groups? You got here how every black woman in America who's gotten anywhere has done by being <laughs> like Ginger Rogers said, I did everything Fred Astaire did, but backwards in heels. Well, I cried during his whole mm -hmm. speech. It just felt like such a relief, Renee Graham. <laughs> you know, it felt like a moment to actually exhale. You know, it had been such a triggering process um, that when you finally got to Cory Booker and he made those statements, obviously they, they left Judge Brown in tears, but I think a lot of Black women felt exactly the same way. At the same time, there was also a part of me that was troubled, not by what she said, but by the fact that you would even need to tell someone with her qualifications, you are worthy. And you need to make that statement because the society <laughs> in which she lives, in which we all live, does not affirm that. And so that felt a little disheartening to me. I understand why he did it, and I was glad he did, but it didn't speak well of this country that you would need to tell someone like Judge Jackson, you are a great American and you are worthy. And I would note that she has one more gauntlet to go through. She won't be there, but the Senate committee will vote on Monday. And um, perhaps anybody has noticed this, but Monday is also April 4th, April 4th is the 54th anniversary of the assassination of Martin Luther King Jr. I just find it kind of chilling 
that you know these things are happening in our in this in this his, all of this history is happening for us to reflect on and we can see her journey and see some other things that have not happened since that time but in any case well, uh, yes, well, go I, ahead, Tracy. Uh, 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 you, you make a good point about history and Martin Luther King's assassination. Uh, and many of the folks that watch this either aren't old enough or don't remember. Thurgood Marshall, when he was uh, right. in front of the Senate, went through an awful lot of nonsense and, frankly, garbage. It wasn't quite the same that Katanji uh, Brown Jackson went through, but it was also embarrassing. I mean, they were asking him questions that no one, with his qualifications and his experience should have been asked. I mean, Thurgood Marshall could run circles around uh, some of the senators, and, and he was, uh, it was embarrassing there as well. Now, again, we don't have the collective memory, but what happened to Thurgood Marshall uh, did not surprise anybody uh, back in the mid 60s. And what happened to Katanji Brown uh, Jackson shouldn't surprise anybody uh, today either. This is All just right. how we roll. <laughs> Well, that's a good place to end the broadcast and um, for, because we do need to remember that. Thank you all for joining me and um, stay with us as we continue our digital converse, our conversation on our digital platforms, Facebook and YouTube. I'm Callie Crossley, host of Under the Radar 89.7. We are on Facebook and YouTube with our post show, continuing our discussion on the nomination of Judge Katanji Brown Jackson. Um, Tracy, I just wanted to pick up on something you said because I was curious about uh, what exactly the ABA or anybody rated Thurgood Marshall at the time they rated him acceptable. <laughs> I, I can't remember if they said highly, so I think it was just acceptable. Uh <laughs> I, I, I don't remember either. Uh, I think that's right, but I don't want to be on the record as saying that that was the case. But again, Thurgood Marshall, he won, and Renee Landers may be able to help me out, I believe he won 29 of the 32 Supreme Court cases he argued. Now, a few of those, he was the Solicitor General of the United States. And one of the ones that he lost actually was Miranda versus Arizona. Uh, so that's not a bad loss to have on your side, but Thurgood Marshall won 29 of 32 cases as a litigate in front of the Supreme Court. The notion that he wasn't qualified, it's just silly, but they, some, some of the Southern senators, and they were Democrats, all of them were Democrats, yeah. asked him these arcane questions that frankly, you wouldn't even ask to a first year law student. And it was all an attempt to embarrass him and this nomination. And, and this is just a replay of that although another 50 years later. And it's sad. It's really sad. I would note there is one through line. Renee Landers, if you want to weigh in, you can. But the through line is that they did press Thurgood Marshall about crime and what he was going to do about crime and his being somehow uh, light on crime or not serious about it. And, you know, that was his version of child pornography questioning at the time. Um, and I urge everybody to read Will Haygood's book, thorough book about that nomination process, which is shocking, maybe not to us, uh, but amazing uh, to see that history unfold. And now we see it repeated. Renee Landers, did you want to add? Well, uh, what I think was unfortunate about this <clears throat> is that Katanji Brown Jackson has a career path that is um, not the same as the career path of the other justices on the court right now, neither the women or the men. And I think because she's done so many different things, uh, you know, uh, been a public defender, uh, worked in a private law firm in different capacities, experienced, uh, you know, the difficulties of a woman with a family trying to, uh, to navigate that world, uh, been on the United States Sentencing Commission, and, and then served finally as a federal judge. Um, it's a very different path than many of the others sitting on the court now who, you know, did some stint in, you know, uh, you know the, the Justice Department and then, you know, immediately became a federal judge. And so I think she's going to bring um, 
a lot of different experiences in the law and not just different experiences as an African-American woman to the court. And I think that obscuring that um, that uniqueness and that that value that she will add to their deliberations was another unfortunate casualty of these hearings and the way they were conducted. Here's a f- some facts that are interesting. Uh, 240 African-American judges on the federal courts, all are over 65, only four are women. If confirmed, Judge Katanji Brown Jackson would be the youngest, second <laughs> only to Amy Coney Barrett, who is one year younger at 50. So that's some interesting. Yeah. Um, so it just, hey, it, can, go ahead, Tracy. Can I, can I, go, I want to go back to your point because I'm not sure everyone picked it up. Uh, when you talked about how they accused Thurgood Marshall of being soft on crime, that was another example of the, frankly, ignorance of the people questioning Thurgood Marshall back then, because anybody that knows anything about what the NAACP Legal Defense Fund did in the 40s and 50s and 60s is they purposely stayed away from people, representing people who were clearly guilty. Thurgood Marshall wanted to represent people, particularly Black folks, who were innocent. And so the, to accuse him of being soft on crime, just like to accuse uh, Kata- Judge Brax- Brown Jackson as being you know, somehow soft on pornography, is just crazy. It, it, it ignores the history. And in this case, her hands were tied. It's not like she had complete discretion to decide these sentences for these uh, people who have been convicted. This is all about the sentencing guidelines. And the senators know that. Well, they, they know that. I don't think they they cared. They were really trying to of course make not. a point right. beyond um, just to besmirch her if they could, and um, and, and that, they and wanted that, her they, cooperation. They didn't get it, so there is that. Right. Um, and, they, and that goes back to what you said about Thurgood Marshall. They knew Thurgood Marshall right. wasn't soft on crime. It was it was all just a, a ruse. <clears throat> so here's one thing that we can um, look back to Thurgood Marshall and his his time on the court. We know for sure that he was awfully influential. It was a different kind of court, but behind the scenes in those discussions, um, he weighed heavily in in those discussions. Now, we know that this is a different kind of court that uh, Judge Brown Jackson would be ascending to. However, I'd like to ask you all if you what you think about what everybody has said is her gift, which is that persuasion, that um, able to bring all these uh, complicated issues <clears throat> down to the point of of understanding for the people and that if that can be employed behind the scenes perhaps not to change the vote but over time that would have some significant impact i like to think what i'll take anybody who what what do you think not going to happen, Callie. Not going to okay. happen. Okay, there's negative nanny. Not gonna, not gonna <laughs> okay, okay. Well, well, I mean, okay, <laughs> negative nanny Tracy. Go ahead. Okay. Well, look, I, 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 I don't say that to be negative per se. It's just the folks on the Supreme Court, right? They have their minds made up on certainly these hot button issues that the public pays attention to and that the press pays attention to. I am not saying she won't have any ability to persuade these people uh, while she's up there, but on the hot button issues, it's just not going to happen. Just for example, you know, if Clarence Thomas, if you've been watching the news about his wife, you would think that the other justices, no matter what their political stripe, would be able to walk into his chambers and say, look, we have got an appearance problem. We've got a real optics problem with this. You need to recuse yourself. That's not going to happen. Hmm. Not only is Thomas not going to recuse himself, none of those folks up there are likely to go in and put the pressure on him. As smart as Kata- you know, Brown Judge Brown Jackson is, and I know she was in my class, she was extremely smart, all right? And at times persuasive, she's not going to persuade any of those folks to vote in a way that they might otherwise have voted had she not been there. Ha- right. Having said that, mm-hmm. I hope she still brings her whole self to the high court. Mm-hmm. I hope she does not censor herself. I hope she does not restrict all of the abilities and qualifications she has. Yes, yeah, she's probably not going to sway the more hardcore <laughs> justices. That's probably just not going to happen. That's true. But that doesn't mean she can't try. That doesn't mean that she can't be that voice that 
otherwise would not be there. And that's part of the lived experience. That's part of the qualifications. You know, every person, every black person in these white spaces has to make that decision. Mm -hmm. Am I going to go along to get along mm -hmm. or am I going to make some noise? I hope she makes some noise. I, I hope so, too. But Thurgood Marshall, most of the noise that Thurgood Marshall made after the court change, particularly with the Nixon appointees in, in, in the late 60s, he made his noise in dissenting opinions. That's right? true. There's, there's, there's stories That's about how so this is now. Yeah. But you have to know that you've done what you can do. That's the but thing. The story, Leave it on the field. You have to know what you can do. Right. Right, but the story that often comes up. Before, I'm, right. I'm, waiting, I'm waiting for baseball to come back. So, Renee Landers, uh, some people say that dissenting opinions are really a blueprint for the future. Yeah, I think that, that there's a tradition of that. Um, you know, the um, I guess it's the second Justice Harlan Wright was the, um, you know, am I right, Tracy? Was it the second or the first? I'm always confused. But you're anyway, thinking, you're those thinking dissents of the first, had been were very influential. Right. And then in some of the early, the cases in, um, you know, the, the New Deal era where the Supreme Court was striking down Congress's efforts to um, deal with, you know, the really <clears throat> terrible economy at the time during the Depression, um, the dissenting opinions within a very few years because of public sentiment uh, ended up being um, a majority uh, you know, taking the majority position on the court. Um, so, yes, I agree that the dissents um, can be very important. And they also send a message to the public that, you know, hey, there are actually some people up here on the court that are hearing you and that are understanding that there's a different way to look at these issues that might be important. But um, I also want to point out that I think that um, in these um, appellate courts or any <clears throat> uh, agency process where the decision is made by a group and the majority wins. But these are very hard situations if you care very deeply about an issue or the outcome of a case and uh, the decision goes against you. And so I think that we as a, as a public have to, you know, kind of give support uh, to that kind of uh, that kind of dynamic that happens in these collective decision-making bodies, because I think it must be a very hard job right now for people like Justice uh, Sotomayor, uh, Justice Kagan, uh, and, um, uh, and you know, Justice Breyer, who's, who's leaving. I, th I think it's a very hard, very hard to be in that position. So, Dr. Cecil, what, what uh, <laughs> people who want to support her, what should happen there? Because um, what Renee Landers is describing is, you know, uh, even a kind of an extension of the hearings, but in smaller doses, just constantly coming at her. If that's if if uh, if uh, Tracy's right about what's happening behind the scenes. <clears throat> yeah, well, um, I think I think that's a big part of the promise, and perhaps if uh, from another perspective, the threat. Um, these are these are at the end of the day, people. Um, people make complex decisions. They use their logic. And I'd say most people do have a capacity to see things in a much broader way, um, even if they have a really closely held ideal. So I, I think I feel a bit more hopeful uh, that Judge Jackson will be able to at least offer, if not simply her presence to remind people of a different perspective uh, with her experience and how even she looks, but um, her words, her thoughts, her actions uh, with regard to this co collective decision-making. But I would also remind people there's private spaces and then there are public spaces. We get to see the public spaces. For example, you know, when she's um, in that chair answering those questions, she had a very public face. She was very, like composed. She um, articulated all of her thoughts very clearly, deliberately. But I bet you, uh, and I'm, I'm sure many of us on this uh, panel recognize this, what she talked about at dinner that night was probably very different. What she writes might be very different than how she talks with her fellow justices should she make it to the court, which seems very likely. Um, like we have to keep in mind um, the difference between what we can hold inside, what we hold in private spaces, and what we hold in very public ways, and how each of those things might be very different. Yeah, I, I, I that, she'll have a lot going on, but I'm sure I would be. A, I would love to have been a fly on the wall on those conversations um, with her Absolutely. parents as well, who were totally <laughs> stoic. And uh, a number of members of the media tried to interview her parents to sort of get at something. And, and the father said repeatedly, I can't remember what her mom said, she can handle this. She's, she's good. 
That's all they would give up. (laughs) <laughs> Absolutely. They grew yeah. up in a very different yeah. time. I'm sure they recognized a lot of those questions and recognized the implications for answering or not answering in a certain way. And they've also raised their daughter to be a highly successful, well-credentialed um, woman at the top of her field. Uh, so I'm sure they have a lot of faith her in, in her as well. And maybe we can take uh, a point from them too. Well, I will say that on the last, uh, about the last hour of the second day after these many, many hours of her being on, I decided to switch. I don't know if any of you did this. There was a huge national watch party organized by a black woman's organization called Higher Heights. And uh, they had gathered together many other black women's organizations. So their Deltas were on there, all the other sororities. I mentioned Deltas because I'm a Delta, but all the other sororities were on. Um, Other kinds of black women organizations. And they just, it was an ongoing chat. And I was amazed at, uh, not amazed, but it was comforting to watch all the (laughs) in-real-time responses, uh, particularly at the point of Cory Booker. Uh, Many people wrote, Hang on, hang on, we got you, hang on, you only got five more. I mean, it was really, it was so homey, I I guess. Uh, So I'm sure she knew about that as well. It just, it was just a a real black tradition response in the moment, which I thought was interesting to, to note. All right, last comments from each of you about this moment. It seems that she will be that she will get it. Um, the committee mem- we don't know how the committee vote will come down, uh, but there are also, there have already been people who have said they're going um, to, at least one anyway. Maine's uh, Susan Collins has said she's going to support her. She's not on the committee, she's on the full Senate vote. That should mean that even if it came down to 50 50, Maine uh, is, uh, Susan Collins is breaking that, so that would be 51. So they wouldn't even need Kamala Harris's tiebreaker. She would get it. It's a shame it would have to come down to that, but it might. And, um, but in the end, she still would be uh, nominated. Last thoughts? Um, I'll start with uh, you, Tracy. Uh, I, I think she will get it, and I'll just say this. I hope. Uh, that Mitt Romney, former Governor Romney in Massachusetts, who has exercised some independence uh, on some of these hot-button national issues, will do the right thing and vote for her. Because Mitt Romney, very smart guy, he knows how well-qualified Judge Brown Jackson is. So, All right, Renee Landers. Um, uh, I would agree with uh, what Tracy just said. And I think that um, uh, if she is confirmed, which I think is highly likely... Uh, it, it's a it's a great moment for the country that uh, that 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 other barrier has been broken. Cecil, Dr. Cecil, um, I will say that these events really represent and reflect so much of America, both its tremendous heights as well as its difficulties, its depths. And Renee Graham, I am looking forward to hearing and writing the words Supreme Court Justice Katanji mm-hmm. Brown Jackson. Wow, that's a great ending. Thank you all for joining me.